Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to Capital Raising Readiness. My name is Michelle Eisenberg, and I am a program assistant at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. And so as you will see in the chat in a moment, the NASDAQ Center provides programs, resources, and exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So definitely make sure to check out those links and resources in the chat. And then just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First, let us know where you're dialing in from in the chat. We always love to connect. And second, we're going to open up for a live Q&A at the end of the event. So please make sure to submit your questions for us in that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation, and we will try our best to get to all of them. And of course, none of what we do could be possible at the center without all of the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Sincini, Woodruff Sawyer, Microsoft Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact, BPM, and HubSpot for Startups. We are humbled by their contributions and hope you are grateful too. And so before we get started, we like to launch a few polls just to step back and see how everyone in the room is doing at the moment. So this first one is going to ask you, how are you feeling? Fearful, anxious, surviving, or optimistic? And I'll give it just a few moments for everyone to submit a response here. Thank you, thank you. All right, we got people from Texas, Pennsylvania, Madrid, Ohio, Georgia, Toronto, California. California, Colorado, Florida, New York, South Carolina. Welcome, welcome everyone. All right, I'm going to end this poll and share these results. Awesome. Looks like optimism is in the lead. We always love to see that, but we do have some feelings of surviving and anxiety. I'm very confident our conversation today may help with some of those feelings. So I'm going to stop sharing this poll and launch the second poll, which is going to ask, what is keeping you up at night? Finance, sales, marketing, scale, pivot, team, or surviving? And this one just tells us a little bit more about your current entrepreneurial needs so we can continue to provide relevant content for all of you. And I'll give this one just a few more moments. Thank you, thank you for participating. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll, share these results. All right, looks like finance in the lead, very fitting for our conversation today, but we do have needs all across the board. So we will take this into account. I'm gonna stop sharing this poll and we just have one more poll. And this one's gonna ask, what part of the capital raising journey are you looking to learn more about? Angel investment, venture capital, emerging finance models, non-dilutive pathways or friends and family funding. And this one will, you know, just give us a little bit more information as we continue to develop programming uh, around capital pathways and the capital raising journey. So thank you for participating here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll, share these results. All right, it looks like angel investment, venture capital tied in first, but we do have uh, interests all across the board here as well. So thank you all for participating in these polls. And I'm going to stop sharing this one without any further delay. Please join me in giving the warmest welcome to our moderator, Selena Aponte, our VP of Strategy at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Selena, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to pass it right over to you. Hi, well, I'm thrilled to be here today and ha having this important conversation with you all. We were reflecting earlier, I've never met an entrepreneur who has said raising capital is easy. And I know we're all enjoying some, hopefully summer vacation and raising capital is not uh, that experience for anyone, let alone in a good market or even 
you know, thinking about this current market. So we're here for you and we're here today and we've structured this conversation to give you some very specific tools and pathways as you think about your capital journey. And to do this, we have, I'm very excited about these guests. We have two very special guests to guide the conversation. So first I'd like to welcome Julie Zellman Davis. And Julie um, is the senior special counsel, counsel at the um, SEC, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and specifically working at the Office of the Advocate for Small Business Capital Formation. And so, Julie, as you come online here, I just want you to answer the question for me, out of everything you could be doing with this next hour of your time, why are you here and what are you most excited about to explore today? Oh, well, thank you. I'm here because I love working with entrepreneurs and sharing the resources that my small little office at the SEC has put together. Um, should I take this time now to introduce my office or are we going to, do you want to bring yeah, it Yeah, why up? don't you do that, okay. really? And then we'll, sure. we'll go home. Great. Well, um, so as Selena said, I'm Julie Zellman Davis. I'm with the office at the SEC that has the longest title. It's the Office of the Advocate for Small Business Capital Formation. It's a very long title, so we just call ourselves the SEC Small Business Advocacy Team. And I need to start with the lovely government disclaimer that anything I say today is provided in my official capacity as a staff member of that very long titled office. Um, but it does not necessarily reflect the views of the commission, the commissioners, or other members of the SEC staff. So um, maybe as part of my intro, I could just go into a little bit of the question that we always get when we go to events with early stage um, uh, entrepreneurs and investors, which is why is the SEC here? I think a lot of folks, a lot of people think of the SEC as going after financial fraud or overseeing Wall Street. And yes, those you know things that our agency does are certainly a huge part of it and the investor protection that we, we work to bring. But the agency also has an equally important part of our mission, which is to facilitate capital formation. And we wanna make sure that companies understand the rules and how to comply with them. So our office is relatively new at the, agent, at the agency. We were established by Congress to advocate both within the SEC and externally for solutions to challenges faced by small businesses and their investors when they're raising capital. And included in that mandate from Congress is a particular emphasis on identifying unique capital raising challenges faced by minority and women-owned businesses as well as rural businesses and businesses impacted by natural disaster. And I'll be honest, when you ask why, why would I want to spend this hour here? Like Those are my favorite parts of the mission, which is to bring in feedback and help those who may not have already been engaging with the agency. So I'm really looking forward to sharing more and happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Julie will talk us through some of the regulatory pathways, structures, landscape. And so welcome. Thank you for contributing to this conversation. I am really excited next to introduce a Milestone Maker alumni, which is the program that Michelle referenced very briefly. It's one of our immersive programs here at the center um, where we help entrepreneurs set and define a business milestone. So be sure to check it out. Um, but without further ado, may I invite Jennifer Williams, who's the founder and CEO of Diverse. And I would like you to share just a little bit about the incredible company you're building, your why, and also share a little bit. You're a busy, busy CEO, and you're giving us this time today. What's brought you to this conversation? Well, first of all, thank you, Selena. Julie, I am grateful to be here and to have you ask me questions and to be able to ask the SEC office with the longest name ever questions. <laughs> So that is exciting. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer L. Williams. I am the founder and CEO of Diverse. Diverse is a proprietary AI specifically designed and trained by individuals who are overlooked. So we have a consciously counter biased and intersectional approach that allows us and our AI to see what others can't see and can adapt to what others can't imagine. We focus in on branding, HR, and management as the central hubs where AI could do the most good and where individuals are the most excluded. Um, in regards to how I got here, ooh, uh, COVID and life, it has been such a windy road. Um, 
born and raised in DC, went to Howard University, moved to New York shortly thereafter, fell into HR. And because I look like this, I also fell into DEI or rather it fell into me. Um, did that for a number of years in a number of different sectors, decided to go off on my own to start my own solopreneurship in January of 2020. Yeah, uh, timing, so great. So when the bottom fell out of life in March of 2020, I was like, yep, we've done it. I have just broken everything. Life is over. Everything is terrible. Um, May the 25th is the day that George Floyd was murdered. May the 25th is also my birthday. And what I did not know, it was the unofficial beginning of Diverse. I don't know if everyone remembers, but there was this groundswell of must hire CDO, must figure DEI, must let everyone know that our company thinks that Black Lives Matter. There was an overabundance of performative DEI, and there was very little data to back up how well or how poorly these initiatives were doing. And as someone who practices strategic DEI and I, diversity, equity, inclusion, and intersectionality, I was floored at the amount of money that was being given to this space without having any real quantitative understanding of what and how it was helping. Uh, I think at the end of 2020, over 175 million with an M dollars were being spent in the DEI space. And my favorite thing to do is go, okay, so how much better is your company? How much did your employees learn? How are they incorporating those learnings in their day-to-day -day business life? If you can't answer me, that's a problem. And DEI was the only sector where that kind of money was being spent without there being a very clear through line between money spent and data and ROI. Uh, so I didn't see a thing. And I decided that that thing needed to exist. And it needed to be intersectional, again, because I look like this. And that is how Diverse came to be Diverse. Incredible. And so Jennifer is here to guide us through her experience um, raising capital. And there's a saying, you know, you're always raising capital. So you raise and then you think about the next raise. And so really understanding behind the scenes, her decision making process and challenges. So thank you for sharing that journey, um, which has started and which is continuing. So let's dive in. Um, my first question is for you, actually, Jennifer, can you just start talking, you shared a little bit about the early days of your company, but let's just orient that a little bit to the big decisions you had to make around raising capital, how you, how you were struck, how you chose to be structured as a company. Um, you know, what were some of the challenges you faced in those early days? Here you are, you have your value proposition, you have your why, you have your, you're off to the races, with momentum behind you, and then what? Ooh, the and then what is the thing. So first of all, I think it's really important to note that this, the whole entrepreneurship thing that I'm doing right now, had no idea it was going to happen. Um, still am very curious as to how I got here. Very excited to be here. I think it's dope. Um, I kind of stumbled into being a founder and specifically being a tech founder in the AI space. Um, I remember in the early days, I think it's really important to note my co-founder, uh, Jared Allison Droney, someone I have known for almost 15 years now, um, is my co-founder. And before we even start with capital and everything else, it is imperative that you have a very clear agreement with a person that you're going to be doing work with. And I would be remiss if I didn't have that conversation. And that line of thought is very important. Uh, Jared is a dear friend. I want him to remain a dear friend. And so clear and demarcated lines as to what is and what isn't is super important. That then created an understanding that I was going to be CEO. He was going to be CTO. And we would move accordingly. That then created an opportunity for us to have to actually figure out what we were going to do and how we were going to incorporate. I found a lawyer on Google. I do not suggest finding a lawyer on Google. I do, however, suggest getting with someone and asking around to find a lawyer that is startup friendly. There's a different lens that startup lawyers have and use. Uh, so 
very quickly, I found out that all law is not the same law. You, you learn that relatively quickly. Um, I then, however, had a conversation with my accountant who very strongly suggested that we uh, incorporate as a C Corp, a C corporation, uh, as that is uh, for startups that are looking for outside funding, C Corps are usually the right decision. Uh, you will see that a lot of these companies are incorporated in Delaware. And I had a very big problem with that. And I was like, I don't live in Delaware. That feels like lies. I can't lie and say I'm in Delaware. My company is in New York. Uh, and incorporating in Delaware and living in Delaware are two different things. I found out that incorporating in Delaware is often a good choice because it's a business friendly environment. And so there's a lot of openness and willingness when you do that there. I will also say after we set up um, the thought of the C Corp, one of the biggest things was figuring out how the big guys did it. Google is a C Corp. Meta is a C Corp. And if it's good enough for the big players, which we will be, then it's good enough for my organization. So I thought that we should follow that and we should create a pathway that's as easy as possible to receive funding whenever that happened. That's a great, that's a great segue to Julie. Um, and do you want to share with us from SEC perspective what the current capital raising landscape looks like? And share with us some of the challenges that entrepreneurs are facing. Again, with the commitment we all share for you here today, um, that there are, we hope each of you will leave with specific insights and new tools as a result of this conversation. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I love what Jennifer has to say because, you know, and also just the way Selena introduced all of this, which is we know capital raising is very challenging. And we also know that no matter how many times you've done it, it's still not something that comes as part of your everyday duties because, you know, you're running a business, you have other things to do. And, you know, it's, it's tricky. So one of the things our office really works to do is to put out resources and data to help folks understand the landscape and hopefully understand some of the complexities and make it less, you know, so that the, your answers to that, that polling question in the beginning are more optimistic and not fearful or anxious of, of what you're about to embark on. So if it's okay, I'm gonna share my screen for a little bit of data. Um, let's see here. Let me know if you can see my slides. Um, all right, so this, oh, so I think after the event, or maybe already, you will receive a big slide deck that we put out. It's got way more in there than we could ever cover on a one hour call and you'd be bored to tears if I read through my slide deck. But I know some folks love to have resources in their hands. So we'll center on the whole thing. But I've pulled out just a few that I think really kind of help set the stage um, on the starting landscape and what we um, in our office report on. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think most folks, at least if you're looking at raising investment capital, probably first you've looked for non-dilutive capital, such as grants or cash reserves from your business or personal funds. But of course, the starting line isn't the same for everyone because many you know, founders don't have personal funds available. Some do, some don't. And you know, this slide shows that you can see over there on the, the right-hand side, the gap between those endpoints on the right side, the inequalities across demographic groups in the US um, that entrepreneurs who are black or Latino face additional barriers to entry because they have lower on average household net worth, which affects their ability to tap into personal assets as a funding source. And you know, similarly, Disparities in income uh, distribution also add to hurdles for some minority founders. And so not only does race often impact the starting line, but place does as well. This slide shows that things are tough for rural businesses as well. The number of rural businesses has decreased below replacement level, and it's you know they don't often have that ecosystem that others may have around them to help um, foster their growth. Gender is also a factor. Uh, you can see on the left, in the yellow graph, that uh, women's share of funding continues to lag, especially when compared to deals with men-only founders, which is the Navy graph on the right. Um, but a big piece of what founders are getting funding is who are the funders, right? Who are the investors? And um, 
This slide shows that women and minorities are also underrepresented among angel investors, which is a key um, significant source of early stage capital. And the diversity in this group is important as well because diversity among early stage investors is shown to facilitate greater funding of diverse founders. Uh, minority and women investors are three to four times more likely to invest in minority and women entrepreneurs. So no surprise probably to folks uh, pattern matching and investor biases are persistent obstacles to capital raising for underrepresented founders. But don't want to be all doom and gloom. <laughs> there is also some encouraging trends. Um, one that I'll just focus on here is crowdfunding, um, which if you haven't heard of that, allows a company to raise relatively small amounts of money from investors or you know, the crowd online via a, red, uh, a registered funding portal or a broker dealer. And you know, from here, you can see some data that while it's still not widely used, the number and size of crowdfunding offerings is increasing. It's a relatively new pathway that came online after Congress passed the Jobs Act of 2012 about a decade ago. So many of the crowdfunding offerings that we're seeing supporting more traditional businesses as opposed to the tech businesses that may have that you know, steep um, potential growth curve and uh, more likely to attract venture capital. So women and women founded and minority founded companies make up a significant percentage of the crowdfunding companies that raised over a million dollars. You can see the bubbles there were 40 percent, 40, sorry, 41 percent had minority founders, 46 percent had women founders. So, again, it's um, there's a lot of data in our annual report, but I did want to at least end that little that, your question there with something positive. Well, thank you, Julie. And, you know, just honoring the lived experiences that each of you and entrepreneurs collectively have. Jennifer, can you just share your perspective a little bit in walk us through um, what when you when you first raised capital, what was your decision making process? How did you choose the capital pathway most suitable? And what considerations did you take into account when you were making those decisions? So again, as a first time founder, knowing that we had a good idea and also Julie just spoke openly about some of the challenges that occur in the space when you are a black woman. Um, I knew that it was going to be a long road so we bootstrapped. I do not want to look at my credit card bill. Thank you, Amex, for allowing me to do things with it. Um, because it was important, we needed to be able to get tools, you know, purchase things on the cloud, make sure that we were good and solvent. I think one of the things that helped us the most was apart from being in the Milestone Makers program, I was also in the inaugural cohort for the AWS Women's Impact Accelerator. And that gave us $150,000 of non-dilutive funds. Um, non-dilutive funds basically mean no strings attached. You get them, you can use them, everybody's happy. Trust me, we were very happy and we utilized that money extraordinarily carefully. Um, and then went back to bootstrapping the conversation about having a friends and family round commenced and we raised about 35,000 in friends and family with an understanding that because I am in a minoritized environment, wealth, generational wealth isn't something that is usually there. So I don't have a rich uncle, um, but I have friends and family that really believe in what we're doing. Uh, and so we were able to do that. And now we are um, looking really hard at opening around with VCs. And that is its own thing. Yes, that is its own thing for sure. So um, Julie, I'm gonna pass it back to you and say, as we are exploring the strategies, so thinking about how can early stage entrepreneurs how do they choose the right capital pathway for them and their business? What guidance would you give? Yeah. So um, we, I guess a lot of folks may not even think to start looking at securities laws at an early stage. They think, oh, you know, I need to think about the SEC when I'm ready to go public or, you know, later down the road. But I think if there's one thing you leave with today in terms of 
securities laws that, that you need to keep in mind. It's regardless of whether you're public or private or at any point when a company is ready to offer security to an investor, the securities laws, and I think folks are glad for this, the securities laws offer investors some protection. So it doesn't matter what stage you're at, you need to be thinking about you know, the securities laws. And so the one takeaway is whenever you offer securities, you either need to register them with the SEC, like in an IPO, or, and what we'll spend most of our time on today, or have an exemption from registration. So I'm gonna share my screen again. We'll talk about some of those exemptions. All right. So the framework that Congress created, starting with the Securities Act of 1933, so a lot of it's been around a while, but it has expanded over time. Um, it starts with that general premise that I mentioned that every offer or sale of securities must be registered with the SEC or conducted under an exemption from registration. And that applies across the board, whether it's a Series A, friends and family, angels, whatever. Um, and I know I've seen some questions in the Q&A about what is a security? And that's, a, that's an age-old question. There's a lot of, um, it's more complicated than it would seem, but it generally includes stock membership interests, options, convertible notes, you know, an, an ownership interest in a business. So um, what are some of the exempt pathways? If you're not ready to do an IPO, no one starts off with an IPO. That just wouldn't make sense. If you're, so if you're looking at an exempt pathway, um, I'm not gonna walk through each of them right now, but several of them are listed here in the slides and we'll get to them more as we go through hopefully uh, today. Um, this is just a, just a, a fun graphic, I don't know if it's fun, but it's it help, hopefully helps paint the scene. That giant bubble over on the left side is for private placements under Regulation D's 506B. That is far and away the most commonly used exemption. But there are other exemptions. And this is just to give you a scope of scale of kind of how are these exemptions used. And, you know, like you see crowdfunding there in the middle is a, a tiny little dot. Um, so. You asked about you know, the key regulatory considerations as you're trying to decide which of these pathways. I know a lot of folks use this one, but is it right for me? Um, there's kind of four key questions, and I think we'll, we'll talk about them more as we go on. But in, in a nutshell, it's how much money do you need? Where are your investors located? How do you plan to connect with potential investors? Meaning, do you already have a relationship with them? Or will you need to use the internet or other advertising to solicit and connect? And then, are all your investors accredited? So um, I'm sure we can get more into why are those the relevant questions, but those are the those are the big things to be thinking about. Awesome. So moving back to the conversation and thinking about, okay, so Jennifer, you set out your you have you have your vision, you have your yes, you're going big you are modeling against Google and Meta. Um, so that that vision, that exit, that has, has helped you decide to structure as a C-Corp and helped you figure out your pathway for venture. Can you talk a little bit about um, working with accredit accredited investors and actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, Julie, will you define what an accredited investor is and why this distinction is important? And then Jennifer, we're going to go to you. Sure. And if it's okay, I'm going to share my screen again, because we have a resource that I think I want, um, hopefully folks will be able to bookmark these and use them for whatever questions may come up. Um, this page here is the SEC's, we call it our capital raising hub, and you can get to it off of sec.gov under the education tab. Um, but we have um, a number of different resources here, but the one I'll show you to answer your question is what is the role of accredited investors? And this is the definition of accredited investor. We try to break it out. You know, there's lots of you know, long-winded releases that the SEC puts out with lots of good detail. What we've tried to do in our office is boil it down to some plain language sentences. It's not complete. It's not legal advice. There's lots more you may need to know, but if you're looking for the basics, then we have these one pagers that hopefully um, can help break down some of these things to make, again, reduce that anxiety um, 
that some folks are feeling about these things. Um, as you see here, is in terms of how, are, how can an individual qualify as accredited, um, there's financial. So you were talking about your, you know, no rich uncles, but um, this is a key piece, which is, you know, does someone have a net worth of over a million dollars excluding their residents, their primary residents, or income over $200,000 a year with, if you're on your own, or $300,000 with a spouse or partner in each of the uh, prior two years. So that's for an individual. And then if you have a professional criteria, such as if you're uh, if you have a, your Series 7 license or if you happen to be a director, an executive officer or a general partner of the company selling the securities and you're a credit investor for purposes of that deal. So um, there's also ways that entities can qualify as accredited. Um, I won't read through all of them, but we do have the resource if, if folks want to look a little further. Yeah. So I'm going to jump back to you, Jennifer, and just ask, you were so strategic in your decision for your co-founder, right, at the formation. And you thought, okay, this is critical to, you know, we're building a huge company. We're going to be in business for years and years. What's your strategy thinking about investors and credited investors? And, you know, how do you, how do you think about who and the importance of that? Uh, it's not lost on me that in this landscape, the numbers for Black women are abysmal. The in, in the lifespan of a Black woman's business, the median amount that she'll receive is $36,000 um, over the course of however many years she's doing things. 0.025% of funding goes to us. So like, yeah, we're obviously super on the radar and they're giving us all of the things except for the part where they're not. Um, I think two things, right? We think about accredited investment and non-accredited investors, specifically because the no rich uncle thing. Um, going to my friends and my family meant that I was having a lot of conversations with not accredited investors. Um, I knew because I was doing something that wasn't the rule, air quotes mine, shout out to my lawyer, Wendy Halbert, she's great. Uh, I went directly to my lawyer and I was like, hey, someone wants to give me $10. I understand that you said that our cap was 50K, but I'm not going to turn down $10 because that would be dumb. And she's like, okay, non-accredited investment. There is a differentiated path that that takes, different paperwork that they sign. Oh, the paperwork. Um, but it's extraordinarily important because if I do get into the space where I do acquire accredited um, funding, that has to be disclosed so that everyone is very clear about what and how money was being received into my company pre them, right? You also have to understand when we're talking about investment, um, people put money in to get money out. They're investing in you, yes, but they're looking at you and they are hoping that you might be the next Google or you might be the next Uber, right? Or you might be something. And it took me a while to get very comfortable with the fact that when I had conversations with accredited investors, the return on their investment mattered more than anything else. Because I am building a mission-driven company, it was very important to me to engage with individuals who have money, who understand the need for why I'm doing what I'm doing. Specifically, if I'm going to engage with them, I do not want to have to fight someone who is giving me capital to help them understand why it's important that Black women see themselves or individuals with disabilities see themselves it's imperative that there's a level of understanding there. So empathy, specifically when it comes to money, it doesn't necessarily feel like it follows, but it's extremely important for the way that decisions are being made and the way that I think about taking uh, the money of other individuals. So what I'm hearing you do very beautifully is nav navigate a, a, a challenging fundraising market where there aren't endless opportunities, but also really anchored to your ultimate vision of success for the company and the impact you're trying to create in the world and finding that place where you have investors who 
will be with you for a long time, for which you have to report, for which you have to communicate with, um, for which are along that, that journey. And you're, you're navigating and balancing those dynamics. Um, Julie, in navigation and in thinking about tools and navigating these regulatory pathways, um, I think you have a special tool that you're going to share. Why, yes, we do. Um, Back here on our capital raising hub, we have a tool that we put together. I don't know if any of you read as kids or I read to your kids now the choose your own adventure books where you go along and say, oh, what's going to happen to them next? Um, we call this the choose your own adventure tool. Um, and it's got eight questions for, for those who are just starting out. Like I think Jennifer's probably a little further along, but if you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, where am I and what, what pathways should I be looking at? Which ones are right for me? So the SEC can't give you legal advice, and but we can kind of help at least rule out some of the pathways that may or may not be as relevant for you. So it's eight simple questions. And I mean, we could just go through this. Um, if Jennifer, you want to answer some either as, you know, hypothetically or as you or however, um, um, I, I will do this hypothetically. I have a company called Lipstick. Uh, it's great. People, awesome. use, I think in the future, they will use it. And I would like to navigate my options for my company called Lipstick. Perfect. I can assure you my teenage daughters will definitely uh, want to invest. <laughs> All right. So first question is, does your business already exist? Meaning, have you incorporated in, as you said, in Delaware or in some state, um, whether you're an LLC or a corporation? Um, so has Lipstick incorporated or organized? Lipstick has indeed incorporated and organized. Okay. That's a great question. Thank you. You're good. Um, so Lipstick, have you explored your options for external capital? This is that question we talked about earlier about the non-dilutive funding. Have you looked for grants? Um, you know, before you start down the path of looking toward investors? Yes, I have begun looking at grants, Julie. The grant road is quite difficult. I think I need to focus on raising capital from an investor. Okay, so we're at question three. Well, if you're looking at capital from investors, um, have you figured out which exemption from registration might be most appropriate for you? No, Julie, I have not. Well, okay, then good thing you're here. All right, how much money do you plan to raise? So, you know, does Lipstick have a sense of how much money they're gonna need in this round? I want to be smart about this, Julie. I think Lipstick could be a game changer. I also know that raising large amounts of money as a startup could be difficult. So I would say we would be comfortable with the $1 million to $5 million range. Okay, well, then we will select that. Um, all right, Lipstick, here's a, here's a question on how you're going to connect with potential investors. Do you have a network that you think might bear fruit? So you're going to use only your own network where you have those pre-existing substantive relationships or you think you might need to use the internet and go online and do advertising or do you have no idea? Julie, I've been so invested on building lipstick that I truly have no idea. All right. All right, well, you may have no idea how you're gonna get them, but where do you think your potential investors may be located? Are you in a large state like, you know, where you have a local network there, you probably are only gonna to look to folks right in your state or might you look out of state? So like if you're in, I know Jennifer's in New York. So do you have friends and family in Connecticut, New Jersey, or you know, further afield, or do you think you're only gonna look at one state? Hmm. Julie, I think expanding our options is extraordinarily important. I would mm -hmm. then think that out of state would be what we need to focus on. All right. Well, then we will look out of state as well. Do you think all your investors will be accredited? We talked about that definition earlier, meaning wealthy or um, having professional certifications. 
That's a good question, Julie. I do know that individuals who have expressed interest in lipstick wouldn't necessarily fall under the uncredited bucket. So I'm going to say no. Okay. So you don't have a giant family of rich uncles. All right. Well, the results are in. And this is, you know, a the way that the SEC, we put this together is this top row said these are the most relevant pathways. So those are three different types of you know, exemptions. You can click in there and get more information on Reg Crowdfunding, Rule 504, Reg A. And then there's also, there's still some other exemptions that still may be relevant. You may still end up doing a 506B private placement. You may decide it's maybe not as relevant because you are looking with unaccredited investors, but it's still, you may still think, oh no, I've heard about that. I want to look into it. So these are less relevant for you but it, they are still there. And Julie, that, oh, sorry, lipstick. <laughs> I have to speak in myself. I have so much new information now. Thank you very much. Lipstick feels supported. <laughs> that is our goal for lipstick and its many wonderful employees and uh, officers. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Yes. Thank you. Well, that's a perfect segue, and I see some um, questions coming through to chat. Let's let's talk about other resources. Let's talk about other, you know, in this tough economy and hard fundraising cycle. Um, and also, Julie, you know, as you mentioned, how getting founders back to running their companies and doing the innovation and building their businesses versus fundraising, which I think a lot, I think Jennifer, you'll attest to this, can, can be a full-time job in of itself. Um, so what resources have helped you, Jennifer, specifically? And we've got a question in the chat, too, that I'll direct your way on. Were there, well, you, you did, you can answer it, though, accelerators or um, other resources that you specifically did to get to your, the place you are here and what recommendations and secrets do you have? Oh goodness. So I have an accelerator story. Of course I do. Uh, we incorporated in March of 2022. So we are yet still babies. It doesn't feel that way, but we are. And I remember getting all of this information about accelerators and incubators. And I was like, I don't know what that means, but if all the cool kids do it, then I should probably do that as well. Did a little bit of research and I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. I applied for the AWS Black Founder Program and I didn't get in and I was furious. I was like, oh, okay, you don't think that we're good enough? I'll show you. I then <laughs> applied to the NASDAQ Milestone Makers Program, the AWS Women's Impact Accelerator, and the Black Ambition Prize, and got accepted to all three at the same time. <sighs> Spoiler alert, it was a very, very <laughs> long and hard <laughs> uh, road with a lot of information being thrown at me relatively quickly. I would not uh, suggest going down the path of doing everything at the same time. However, I will say that getting that level of support and guidance and information that quickly and having individual advisors focus in on what some of my pain points were and what my challenges were overall made me a better founder, specifically because I never saw myself in this space. So the accelerator and incubator model has been integral to my success to get here. Um, the resources that you are provided, I mean, Julie, apart from this, I know when I started, I did not know that the SEC could and would be somewhere that I could start to look for things. You learn that as you go along, but you also want to ensure that you know what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with. As a CEO, I think my superpower is being really great at certain things and really bad at others and being really honest about what I'm not good at. Um, quite honestly, and I've said this to both of you, Selena and Julie, fundraising makes me horrifically uncomfortable. And it is integral <laughs> if I want to continue building my business in the way that I am building it. And so the thought process then is, is leaning in, getting as much information as possible. Any accelerator, incubator you see, you should apply. Um, 
Obviously the ones that are attached with Lon Deluta funding are amazing and can help you move your business along as you're learning and growing. There may not be a lot of those available in your area. There may be, but you should apply. You should also look to see individuals who have gone through the program before because it informs you of how and why the program works the way it works and what you're doing. Um, I did my research. I understood how granular Milestone Makers was, and it was granular. Ooh, there was a lot of homework. It was amazing. I'm like, I'm back in school. How did I get here? Um, the AWS program was eight weeks of rigorous training. There were classes every day. There were in-persons for two weeks. But you also have to understand that these accelerators and these incubators are working towards making you a capable, comfortable founder. And I know that without that experience, there's no way I would be able to be on a call like this and feel calm and comfortable and feel as if I have some kind of leverage or I have the right, let's say, to go out and ask people for money because it's not the easiest thing to do. Just wanna pause and celebrate that because that is a big milestone in of itself as an entrepreneur and honor the hard work it took to get here and, you know, excitement for all that lies ahead. Um, I have another question. I know we're quickly running out of time here. We've talked a lot about raising capital. Um, we haven't talked a lot about choosing not to raise capital or choosing not to raise capital at this moment in time and focus on customers or, you know, other boot, you know, choosing to bootstrap longer. And obviously there are seasons um, and there are seasons where you make a strategic decision not to. So I think it's really important as entrepreneurs to talk about the, the no and when you choose no also. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna open that up to both Julie and Jennifer and you know, what are the some of the high level, I know we're not gonna cover it in the next three minutes, but pros and cons of seeking outside investment and how you feel about making that decision. I think this is, Jennifer's gonna have a whole lot more to say on this than I will, so I'll be very brief and then let her take the stage. But only 6% of small businesses raise investment capital. So that's a pretty small number. Um, so, you know, we are fully aware, and of course at the SEC, we are interested in securities. So we, we do investment capital, that is where we're focused, but we are fully aware that it is not for everyone. And once you bring on that investor, I love the way Jennifer was saying, you need to make sure that there's someone you want to partner with that is going to be with you. It may be a long time and that they bring you something strategic or that they share your values because um, it's a big decision. So with that, I'll turn it over to the person who's actually making these decisions. Thank you, Julie. Uh, everything you said, yes. Uh, also, we've been bootstrapping up until this point. So we are now going out into the wild world of having conversations with VCs. Oh, what fun. Um, because I'm someone who also does a lot of research, I knew that if I had a mission-driven organization, I would want to work with mission-driven venture capitalists. The challenge, however, when I did my homework and looked about what raising seed funding or Series A funding could and would do working with these establishments, unfortunately, the numbers for individuals who will get funding outside of minoritized or mission-driven VCs is almost half lessened. So you will have a harder time actually working with the resources that were built to help you succeed in a space where you're not seen and you're not expected to succeed. Yeah, that's what I said. Um, so it's also understanding that the VCs always don't have the answers. I think there's so many founders who believe that if someone has a lot of money, they know what they're doing. Y'all, here's a secret. I've had conversations with multiple VCs. When I tell you a lot of them don't know what they're doing is wild. And also you need to understand 99% of startups fail. 99% of them, okay? which means that a gamble on the 1% 
that might become a unicorn or a dragon is always the face or the force that's guiding these VCs, which also means in a portfolio of 10 or 20 or 30 companies, they're literally only looking at one to recoup their return on investment. You have to look strategically at the way individuals who are giving you money are thinking about money. I think you bring up a really, you know, important point on the model of venture capital specifically and um, angel capital as as a predecessor to that. And, you know, what other industry would you still have a job if you got it wrong nine out of 10 times? I wouldn't have a job. (laughs) And that's truly how it's structured. So I think that's a very tangible, and we certainly have classes and resources that look at the business model of venture capital. For anyone that's curious, I'll invite Anna and Michelle to to send some resources your way. Um, But you bring up another really, so, so Jennifer and Julie both, you know, thinking about you know, the pros and cons, Julie, certainly looking at market dynamics and, you know, macroeconomics as a factor. And, you know, Jennifer, I hear you very clearly back to your why and, you know, what you're trying to build and who who you need in that journey and what capital you need. Um, And so, you know, we've talked a lot about Um, resources needed to raise capital. And there's a cost to raising capital as well. There's certainly a cost in your time. I'd invite anyone that's raised capital to share in chat how many hours they spent raising that capital. Jennifer, how many hours do you think you spent raising that first, you know, friends and family round you did? Yes. Yes. And, and, (laughs) and. Um, But there's a couple questions in chat I just want to address specifically around, you know, there's some costs involved in crowdfunding. There's, so Julie, how how do you, um, you know, how do you sort of understand or even model out the the costs of, of raising capital, both, you know, in terms of your time and resource but also in terms of actual dollars out needed to to raise capital as you think in this context of pros and cons and is this my right moment and what decisions do I need to make? Great question. Um, So, you know, at the SEC, we don't necessarily track or know um, exactly how much it's costing folks to raise under a certain um, exemption. So we know that there are filing fees if you do an IPO, there's registration fees. There's no fee to the SEC for all of the exempt offerings, any filings you need to do with us. But in terms of the amount that goes into it behind the scenes, you know, that I think it differs across the board and we don't have insight into that. Um, one thing I will say when you, if you use that navigator tool, the, the more relevant pathways that show up at the top, you know, it does, part of that is based on, okay, like crowdfund, if you had, if Jennifer and Lipstick had selected more than $5 million, then it would not have put red crowdfunding up there because there's a cap, red crowdfunding, you can only raise $5 million in a year. So there's, the, the navigator shoots out answers based on, um, you know, both the, the actual rule. So if you wanna raise more than five, we're not gonna suggest a, an exemption that has more than five. That allows only up to five. The other piece that's going into that is what exemptions are people using who raise that much? So if you choose, you know, very, I don't, very few will say people choose to do an IPO to raise less than $75 million. Even that is quite a a smaller IPO, a public offering. And that's because there are expenses involved and then you become a public company and lots of reasons. So when you go through that pathway, you you can kind of see just like Jennifer looked to see, okay, what have others done in this space? You know, you could see if it points you to something that's more relevant, that means that others are using it and maybe they're, I'm not saying they're finding it to be completely cost effective, but they have found it to be the most cost effective for the amount that they're raising. I don't know if that helps direct a little bit, but. What Julie said, uh, no, <laughs> I have an interesting crowdfunding perspective. Uh, a dear friend of mine, Don Dixon, who is the CEO and founder of Popcom is the first black woman to raise a million dollars crowdfunding. And she's a dear friend. So I was like, hey, this crowdfunding thing. She was like, absolutely not. (laughs) Absolutely not. Um, 
And specifically her, absolutely not for my company and organization was specifically because of all of the keeping track of things that you have to do because you're getting money from different entities, right? This is also pre WeFunder, pre all of those things. So Don in essence was a pioneer in this space and you know, created all types of spreadsheets and everything else to make sure she was keeping things straight and safe and solid and SEC secure. Um, it's not as difficult now, but I am always thinking about Don's advice, specifically in crowdfunding. I have thought about it. Uh, I had a conversation with my lawyer, Wendy Halbert. She's the truth. Um, and Wendy was like, absolutely not. And Wendy's thought process around crowdfunding was the thought of what you then have to disclose to a funder who is accredited and what you have to put on your cap table and how much more complicated things can get when you are utilizing the crowdfunding model versus a more straight and narrow model. So in multiple ways, I've been told that crowdfunding is not the way or the truth or the light for me or my company. Um, however, <laughs> uh, as a founder, your job, your role, and your responsibility is to look at all avenues that could potentially bring in income. Yeah. So. Can I just and put I, in a plug real quick here? Because I love the story you just told, um, Jennifer, and I know there's others on the call as well. Our office is constantly seeking that kind of feedback. You know, if you just, if you go down a path and say, oh, crowdfunding would have been great except for X, Y, Z. If you could shoot us an email, we're smallbusiness at sec.gov. Hopefully folks can remember that. Um, or you can go on our website and sign up for updates and that'll be a way to be in touch with us. Just send us an email with three bullet points that just says, hey, you know, found, a, figured this out as I was going through my process. We love to get that feedback from folks who are using these exemptions. We may or may not be able to make a change on it. It may be something that, you know, is hardwired and acts of Congress, but it may also be something that, you know, hey, this financial requirement is impossible for us to meet because of X. And we, we at least want to know. And we very much are open to that kind of feedback. So, so we encourage folks to keep in touch with us, both in terms of accessing our resources or saying, hey, this isn't available and I could have used information on whatever it is. Or all the resources we have on our website are because someone said, you know, it'd be really helpful to have a glossary of terms. Okay, we made a glossary of terms. And that's been like something that we've gotten tons of great feedback on. And, you know, so I just encourage folks, small business at sec.gov, let us know what's working Amazing. and what's not. Amazing. And Jennifer, just to highlight what you said that I think is really important in uh, as, a, as a final nugget here is that you thought about not just what you needed to raise immediately, but what your capital path look like. So you knew that you're never going to build your company as big as Facebook or Meta without bringing in traditional outside capital. So you had to make a decision in the short term, okay, it's really hard to go from crowdfunding to traditional sources. So you're gonna, so I think that's a really great takeaway for this, this group here today is that yes, you're making decision for now, but also anchoring to your vision, your dream of exit, your dream of legacy, knowing what you need to build, how are you continuing? So I know, I know we're out of time here. Um, I would just really love, love, love to thank our, our um, guest, Julie, the, the tools, the resource, the open invitation to continue this conversation and have a path to share experiences um, is a gift. And thank you for um, thoughtfully guiding us here today. And Jennifer, celebrating all that you've accomplished to be to this point, um, the grace for which, you know, you've taken an hour out of your day running a, a very successful, busy, busy company to really honestly and truthfully um, share your experience, but also offer really actionable insights for others and pay forward your, your knowledge. And thank you for that. That's something we um, value deeply at the center and really care about, you know, in support of you all as entrepreneurs. Um, and especially in 
a challenging conversation like capital raising. We, we share that goal. We want to get you back there building the innovation and the companies and um, hopefully even enjoying a summer ice cream, uh, ideally on a beach somewhere or on, in, on top of a mountain, but, you know, otherwise in, in some way, shape or form. So thank you so much for the time today. Thank you all. Thank you. This has been a fun conversation. I wish I had hours to talk to Jennifer. <laughs> oh, Julie, you're not doing that easily. You are getting all of the emails at this point. You, you've opened <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> well, Jennifer, Julie, Selena, thank you all so much for such an incredible conversation and just sharing all of your insights uh, at the NASDAQ Center. We're just so grateful uh, for, for your time and, and, and sharing your perspectives. And to our audience, we would love for you to join us again for upcoming webinars, which you can view using that link that's going to be posted in the chat. Thank you all so much for joining us today, and we look forward to welcoming you back online with us soon.